I, what I've done is, is I, I, I was kind of chuckling to myself last evening because I was doing what I did whenever I was in school. I waited until crunch time. <laughs> and of course, I probably won't get an A for the effort, but hopefully we can get you a good B+. Plus. But <clears throat> it all started with a family called Johnston. And we do have a couple of them here by chance. They come over and introduce themselves, which was so kind. They're going to be my truth checker, I told them, if I get off. Because if I take some privilege with some of this, hopefully they can get me back in bounds, which I think we, we need to do, for me anyway. Um, there's three major areas, areas which I could go down. Now, I want to cover all three of them because I think that they are all important. And it's important in the survival of the family's home in, in getting it here today. So we're going to start really with the very first person involved, and that was Alexander Johnston. Alexander Johnston's family, they were actually way back. They had noble roots. They go back to Scotland. That's where they started. And I have an art, I have a, um, a newspaper article that I researched, and they talk about the, I'm trying to pull this, okay. So it was William uh, Johnston in Scotland, he was William the Marquis of Annandale, Earl of Hertfordshire, Viscount of Almen, Lord Johnston of Lashwood. Well, it goes on for another six or eight more titles. But they lost their place in Annandale, and they decided to, to immigrate over to Ireland. I found out today they only stayed there 100 years or more. I couldn't get the time frame, but they were Irishmen true and true by the time they came here. Well, Alexander was a very intense young man, and he had his eye on a particular woman. And he went to the father, and he asked for her hand. Apparently, the father didn't think that he was worthy. Well, being a bit impulsive and what was said, maybe a little ill-tempered. He knocked the guy to the ground. So right after that, he decided the best thing for him to do was put an ocean between he and Ireland. So he came here to the United States. And when he came to the United States, <clears throat> he met a, a buddy of his by the name of Ephraim, and he had an eye for his daughter Elizabeth. And they got married. And they lived in the Greensburg area. I'm looking for a, uh, yeah. They lived in the Greensburg area, where we're not sure of where that was. But he was the guy who really dabbled in all kind of mercantile adventures. And he was pretty good at it. And he made some money in Pittsburgh, came out here, and he bought, which I was corrected today, he bought about 3,000 acres in Unity Township, Derry Township, and Ligonier Township. The whole way down to, to uh, the Sleepy Hollow, and obviously way back up over the hill, and way that way. And um, he actually created a very self-sufficient area here for he and his family. And whenever I tell you his family, I brought this along. They had children starting in 1800 through 1826. They had Isabel, Thomas, William, Alexander, William, because the first William died in the first year, Edward, Andrew, Edward again. He was an eight month old or seven month old when that happened. Um, a James, a John, an Anne, and a Richard. So, they had quite a group of people to take care of and feed, to put it mildly. This home 
When it was built, he had it built between 1813 and 1815. Um, although it gets a little confusing when you read some of the detail on it, you realize that they had one mason, one stone mason <coughs> did this whole thing. It took him 10 years. Because they built the original house, which was approximately 48 by 22. No, 48 by 28. And that was the main section of the house. And what you walk in today and you think is the front door, it was not. It is the back door. The front of this building is actually on the other side. And there was, a, he, was a, he was a Freemason. And they had a, um, a particular right in which when you're building a place like this, you build it in a north-south orientation with a front door to the east. And that's exactly what he did here. Um, there is a discrepancy over what year the additions went on. There were two additions that were done at the same time, undoubtedly, because they balanced the look and the architecture of the house. There was a 22 by 22 on this end, a 22 by 22 on that end. Um, so this was a residence, right? Well, he started the forge, which is just across the, well, it was across the highway. It says that the only, the only trace of the forge is actually a water chute, uh, which I've never seen, but apparently it's in the ground over there because what they did, they used the dam, the Kingston Dam, to power their hammer in the forge. So, um, he failed at that particular thing. And the reason why he failed was two reasons. One is, is there was a huge drop in the price of iron, but unfortunately the ore he was using wasn't of high grade quality. So his product wasn't what it should be. He, however, saw an opportunity because back in the day that he did this, the road out there it was not the Lincoln Highway. It was not the Forbes Road. It wasn't the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Turnpike. It wasn't the Stoystown, the Philadelphia Turnpike. It was just called the Old Trail. But he finds out that there's a Stoystown, Pittsburgh Turnpike coming right past his door, improving this little trail. Because the Forbes Road, which was, which was done prior, actually, to this, it came over the mountain, down to the fort, and supplied the fort with both men and supplies. Then it came down a little further and went up Darlington, up over the hill, and came right down through Youngstown. And Youngstown is actually the oldest municipality I think it was founded, I have to go back to cheat sheets because 77 year old brains don't work the same way. Um, Youngstown incorporated in 1831, which is before Ligonier, before Latrobe, not before Greensburg. Um, so it, it was, it, <clears throat> it having that come down through there, was going to really increase the volume of the Stoys Town piece. So he decides to lease the forge and he takes his home and he turns it into a tavern and an inn because the traffic was so heavy. And some of the slides, um, let me see which way I'm going. Well, you'll see, this is actually the house right there, right? It's hard to discern that, because all of these buildings house everything from pigs to cows to horses to you name it, because they were self-sufficient. This morning I was reading that he never, ever had to go to a butcher shop for anything, in spite of the number of kids. Um, but... Some things that were happening at the same time that had an impact back on the house. 
and how it was going to survive long term was Westmoreland County was part of Bedford County. There, so finally they got to the point in, in and around 1830s, they got to the point where they pulled away and it was, and it was officially done. However, Westmoreland County was then subdivided again. And when they subdivided at this time, the counties of Washington, Fayette, Green, parts of Allegheny, Mercer, Armstrong, and part of Indiana counties were taken out of it. So you can imagine what a humongous county Westmoreland was. In doing that, though, the rationale behind it is we have people coming, and we have people coming, and we have people coming. So therefore, there's plenty of opportunity for them to survive here at this household. So, you know, you, you look at all that and you say, well, it's okay. But if you take it maybe a step or two forward, you realize that there, I gotta see how many born he was. William was their fifth one born. And William, back then you didn't have to go to law school. You just became well read. And you did just set up a shame. Well, he was fairly well educated. The family made sure to that. And um, he went to private school. And he ended up going up to Catania. And he set up a shingle. And he, he, at that point in time, was appointed district attorney of Armstrong County. He went a little on in his career, and the next thing you know, he's elected to the state house. And then he was elected to the state senate. And um, as speaker thereof, the standing governor had passed away. So by operation of succession, he became a governor. However, he really didn't, there was some insight because it was a little sketchy with the Constitution if it should be that way. So what he did was, they talked about different solutions and the obvious one was, let's have an election now. So he did that, he opted, he could have said no, I'm gonna stay there to the end of the term with this one. But he said, no, I'm going to get elected, officially, upright, honestly. So they have a state election. He wins. He, win in, he won in a contest that absolutely has never been anything close to it. He won by 267 votes. That skinny of a margin. And uh, he ran a second time. But in his, in his reign, he signed some of, the, some of the major bills for education in public schools. He was also very, very, very adamant that slavery needs to stop and go no further than the borders of Pennsylvania. And there were a group of people that agreed with him, a big group. When he ran, he lost by less than 2% because of his stance on slavery. So out of, out of this house, there's a lot of history. And the, the history of the other thing is, he's the very first out of, um, for 58 years, Pennsylvania was a state, he was the very first one from Western Pennsylvania. And he was only 34 years old. So he was, he was quite, the, quite the guy. One of the things he did though, um, and I think, let me see if I can pull it. Um, it looks like it would have been somewhere in the 30s, 1830s. There was a financial crisis, a huge one. The stock market at that time went pshh. So Pennsylvania ended up, because they had been involved with in it, it was because of Jackson's War, uh, President Jackson's War. We ended up with a $40 million 
deficit in the state of Pennsylvania. And that's 1830-something. In today's world, it would be a couple hundred million dollars. So he comes up with the idea of doing a relief note guaranteed by the state. He also then, if you can believe a politician would do this, he went ahead and he had a sinking fund set up, which out of their budget, they had to put X amount of money in that sinking fund every year until the debt was paid off. And he did that in his term of office, had it paid off. So this guy was, he was quite the, I think, quite the guy. Um, a little detail that I did miss, he had eight, Alexander had eight sons, two daughters. Every one of his sons was over six foot six. Think about that. Today, that's a huge man. Back then, I can't, they, they had to be unbelievable forces just when they showed up, because these were big guys. Um, so that was a sidetrack. I have to get back on track. Um, so here's a couple of things that I found out locally. Really, Laughlin Town and Ligonier were two towns that were the same size until something happened. And that something that happened was the railroad. The railroad bypassed Laughlin Town, and it shrunk. The railroad bypassed Youngstown, and it shrunk. Of course, it hit Latrobe, and it boomed. It hit Ligonier, because Ligonier coming down from the opposite side of the highway with the Ligonier Valley Railroad, they brought huge amounts of lumber and stone and the likes for a couple of war efforts. But even when it was the high building effort, and I mean the high building effort by saying, um, whenever these guys were here, as Latrobe was building up and Greensburg was building up, all of these drovers we're, we're taking these horses and horse, uh, horse-powered buggies filled with timber from the Ligonier region. They took it into, and, which again, they profited by because there was a toll, which I forgot about. There was a toll sitting somewhere up around um, Sleepy Hollow. And one of the articles I read said that sometimes the, the the drovers would get off the wagon and have to wake the gatekeeper up because the gate was down and he was sound asleep. And they, they said that in some months, there were four different turnpike fees, even back then, and they were making $1,600 a month. Now, $1,600 a month at a time when wages were 50 cents a day for the complete day. So they were kind of lucrative things to have along the way. And to be on your property, I, I assume they got a cut there of some sort uh, to do it. They, it wasn't only William who was, who was quite famous. There were two other brothers. Um, there were two other brothers. There was Alexander um, the second. He went to West Point. And he served um, basically in, in a couple of wars, and he was decorated. And then there was a brother uh, who, who went with his younger brother. I know the younger brother was Richard, and I think it was Captain John, if I think that's right. He uh, went down to the Mexican War, and he established himself as quite a leader, and he had a regiment and all that good stuff but he lost his brother at one of the battles. So Richard died while going to the thing in Mexico. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure, and I didn't ask this question, Spencer, but people would just walk on through. One of the things you'll see when you walk on through here, 
Is there's a fireplace when you walk back this hall and you turn. On your left, there's a room with a fireplace. A big open fireplace. That was really a summer kitchen. Because they didn't want their house really to burn down. So they kept it pretty disconnected, which was kind of unique. The fact is, it was actually covered over whenever um, Smith, who ended up buying the property before we have the Lincoln group here, um, he bought it from the family. I guess, who were the two? Were they two sisters that remained here? There were two sisters that lived out their life here. Right? Becky and Leo. Pardon? Becky and Leo. Okay. So the two of them lived there, and they lived their life here. And I had talked to young Vic Smith, who's still living. Old Vic Smith has passed. But young Vic said he remembers as a kid. He remembers... Um, I'll see if I can get to it. Well, that's that's the kind of traffic you would have seen on the turnpike. <laughs> I put the a butt for you. This is actually a shot of the front of the house as the way it was. And here's a shot looking down. You can see the house here. That I believe is the paper mill where ten mill is now in that. Well, Kennebec wasn't that way. Now it's used for a number of different types of businesses in here. This picture shows you the paper mill is here. That's where the Kennebec piece was. B is the forge, which is back in here. C is the Johnson House over here. And D, can you tell me where else? The railroad station is right here, the Kingston Railroad Station. So it, it was on the other side of the creek, as was the forge and as was the the the, the uh, Ken Metal and the well, that's not Ken Metal, that's, the, that's actually the paper metal. So and they also had a, they had a brickyard over there. So they they did a lot of things here. There was a lot of commerce. Uh, whenever whenever. Um, Whenever William decided to hang it up, he went ahead and was involved in salt mining, oil from Shell producing. He was also in, involved in refinement of, of uh, petroleum. So he followed his dad's footsteps because that's exactly what Alexander did. Alexander lived to be 99 years old. And he got the to live out his days here. You know, very pleasant time for him, for sure. He lost his wife, Elizabeth, at the age of 82. So whatever's in the water down here, you should probably all take some home with you. <laughs> Might help us, for sure. Um, let's see. I just want to make sure I've got the high points for you. I think I, think I hit all of the high points in terms of uh, what transpired in that era of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the family, the house, and the fact that the house stood for what we now, let's say, for 207 years, yes, there was some work done to it that needed, and it had to be reshored. It did change because that entryway, as you saw, I think in one of these pictures. Let's try it again. So, okay, that's the front door. As you'll notice, let me go back one. As you'll notice, the front door actually has a transom. It's, it's a pretty big door. If you look at the next one, this is the back porch, which is now stoned in, and there's a door here, and then there's the door back there. So you'll see that the back door, I'm sure all those boys had to do this to get out the back door. The front door, uh, they were quite comfortable. 
back door, then you can't see the front door from inside the house. Unless you go into the bathroom, open the bathroom, and open the cupboard, right? If you open the cupboard, you'll see the original latch. Still, it's still in place because the outside is locked and changed. But to open the museum, they had to put a bathroom in on this level, obviously. So, do I have any, any questions of any kind? One thing that's interesting about that back porch that you're talking about, yeah. you had mentioned that they had an inn for uh, guests or whatever uh, as they were traveling. Yeah. In that back porch, there was a hole in the wall. And they, it was just on the right hand side of that window. It's gone now. But they did not serve whiskey inside the house. If you wanted whiskey, you got whiskey through the hole oh my for the outside. <laughs> you just stirred something. I, let me see if I can find it quickly. I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was quite unique. They uh, you know it's here. And it was a separate sheet. I thought I'd put it in here because I thought maybe for a uh, here it is. This was uh, actually there were a couple of presidents that actually stayed here. Is that correct? I think it was Tyler and there was two presidents that actually on their way through uh, stayed here and I'll go back to it. I find it but this was Kingston Forge, July 4th, 1819. So it's in apparently a local paper or a local something. And they said a day so generally commemorated did not pass unnoticed among the hardy sons of industry at Kingston. Because this was called the Kingston House. At, the seasonable, at a seasonable hour, a company of 50 met at the Forge House and partook of a past suited for a festival of freedom. Alexander Johnson, one of the proprietors, sat as president, assisted by William Johnston as vice president. The forge men who, placed, who were placed at the head of the table with the, with the venerable Mr. Deslike, a hammer man at the hall. After dinner, the following toasts were drank, accompanied with many cheers. The day. It rescued us from the Lion of Britain. They, may it warn us to beware of the Tiger of France. And they drank. <laughs> the memory of George Washington. And they drank. Too. The memory of heroes who have fallen in the re re revolution. And they drank. Too. Major General St. Clair, the soldier, the statesman, and the friend of General Washington. May Congress be fed on your bread and water until they do be fed. May Congress be fed on bread and water until they do justice to our neighbor. They drank to it. <laughs> the American Eagle, may he wing his way undisturbed by the roaring of the British lion. And they drank to it. <laughs> Freedom of speech and debate in Congress. And they drank to it. Our country, Palestine, Palestine be the arm that will not rise in her defense. Not sure if someone can give me the, the uh, actual meaning of that word. I should have looked at it. P-A-L-S-I-E-D. Anybody? No. Well, but they drank to it. <laughs> and then finally, Kingston Forge, the great support of Westmoreland County, may it not be shackled by taxation. And they drank to it. That was only eight drinks, guys. I, I think a DUI might have been there. But I'm glad you brought that up, because that, that was a tidbit that I wanted to do, and I had forgotten about it. But if you have more questions, or any more from the Johnson family that you think is unique, it should be heard, please. I'm more than welcome. To, you're more than welcome to, to say it. Any any other questions? Any 
Okay, I hope I covered it all. You know, again, I told you, we don't have an A, but I'm hoping for a B plus. <laughs> so I have a question on the date. So when did it switch from the Johnston family to the Smiths? Is that 1979. And then for the Smiths, finished with it, then it, was, it became available then for the Lincoln Highway? 11 years ago. Okay. So that would be 2011. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting to, to, to be involved both times. Um, and I think the best thing that could have happened to us as a region happened. You know, the museum has it, and it's going to be here for a long time. They've done a good job with restoring just the way it was back in 19... What was the date of this? I was thinking 1938. Yeah. I told them, I think when I was a kid in Irwin, I think I may have had coconut pie in this one, but they moved it out the Route 30, and definitely I had uh, french fries and gravy in that one many times. <laughs> one that was in the series that was in uh, Irwin. So, nothing else? Take hold of the of the place, Spencer. Anything? Uh, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Um, hopefully, you learned something. And uh, if you have any lingering questions, then Ralph and I will stick around a little bit, and you can feel free to come up and approach us. Uh, uh, yeah, we can look through. Let some me do it. Can you put this on? No. 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 no all that. Okay. okay. There's a look, and actually, how the back door looks in the day. Now, the, the Smiths went to National Registry and said, look, we want to we want to close that off because they didn't want the weather and they also wanted to have an easier way, I think, to get to your office and the other end. Um, so they agreed as long as it was done with the same stone. And all the stone here came from this one guy you have to realize it may have taken him 10 years because he had to cut the stone, you know, as he went along to end up doing this. It's a little rough, but that was the error, they say. That is how that type of stone was, was laid. It, was, it had a little coarseness to it, if you will. It's not like we see a brick house or something. So there's that one. In the, ah, the Atlantic Gas Station. Does anybody remember that except for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's two of you. Uh, I, that Atlantic gas station, if you would come across the bridge and you made the left to go to Ligonier, you've got to be real quick and make another right. Because that's where you would go. And that's where I started to say, young Dick Smith told me, he remembers as a kid, his dad would take him. And they would do this quick turn by the gas station, and they would come back and around to the Johnston house. And Vic had befriended the two sisters many years back, way before he ever got it. And the, the um, I guess the tale is that when they passed, they asked that he be given the opportunity to make a purchase. That's what Vic tells me that his dad then had an opportunity because of it. They had been such friendly people. He said that he said I could still see the women that have their aprons on, the long dresses, and he said, you know, it was just the way it was. But uh, I think the gas station left in the fifties. Yeah. The gas station. <laughs> so it, it was another venture of the Johnson family.
email me, call me, whatever. Um, I'll be happy I have it on, I have it on uh, my computer and I can email it to you. So that, but I gotta tell you, the whole Scotland thing, if you can wrap your head around it, you're better than I, because I couldn't even come close. It was very detailed and it went and went. And then when you see the number in their family, when you realize he had eight kids to adult with, and then those eight had four or six names. Did anybody have more than 10? Can you think? Yeah. So there you go. So you can see how this Elizabeth and Alexander created a huge amount of people here in West Morning. When I saw some of the names that were intermarried, because they not only gave the birth date, they had the, their married name and then kids under them. So it, it's a pretty big group of people with a lot of names. So please enjoy yourself here for the uh, afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.